as we're gradually moving back to opening schools and businesses and, of course, our in-person interactions, I want to remind you, this is all time with cold and flu season getting going. Staying hydrated is key to helping your body deal with the added stress and with the upcoming flu season. My regular fans have heard me talk about a product called Hydrite for a long time now. It's an amazing rapid rehydration drink. It's a mix that, well, we're obsessed with here. I'm excited to announce they've just released Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, just in time for cold and flu season. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of immune-boosting ingredients. Each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract, creates what is hopefully immune-boosting formula that's high in antioxidants and zinc. Combining this with Hydrolyte's seven key electrolytes, it's a fantastic way to stay proactive and properly hydrated. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water and make a great-tasting drink that has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all natural flavors, and it is gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and it is vegan. And you can find Hydrolyte Plus by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that's H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-W. And be sure to use our code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Test. Oh, there I we have go. to let you on. There it you is are. indeed. We appreciate you being here. Uh, let's give everybody a chance to pile in. We're going to do a little different kind of show today. But uh, very quick. Thank you, quick, Hydrolyte. Thank you, Hydrolyte. Very quickly, I'm looking at Florida because somebody pointed that out to me. Uh, well, let's get Kelly on before you point no, out. No, hold on. Uh <laughs> That uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Florida is having a tiny little surge, but nothing dramatic. So I'm not quite sure. Oh, how high? Did I see how high it is? It's not that high. But okay, we'll talk okay, more about Drew, it. Okay, can I, Drew, can I make an intro first? Sure. So people might see this question. What animals might we need to worry about in regards to the spread of COVID-19? Mm -hmm. I want everybody to think about that because we have a great guest on today who's a veterinarian. We've had a lot of questions about that. But first we have... Dr. Kelly Victory, who happens to be in a pet owner and a COVID expert. But I just wanted to have everybody take a look at that and think about it. And then we'll get back to it because we're well, going to have a even, little contest. Let's even t give it a little more framing, which is that you heard about this app that our veterinary colleagues. Oh, well, we haven't and, heard about it. We haven't told but you. But you heard about it and you thought, I would want that. I want that. I would want to be able to do that, especially during COVID. And we thought, okay, yeah, we're going to share true. this with everybody. That's true. But we're first bringing on Dr. Kelly Victory. Dr. Victory, welcome. Of course, ER doctor, public health official, public health uh, what's your official public health title? Kelly? And in the wings, we have Brandon Warber and Dr. No, Jeff Warber. I'm a public health expert. Expert, I, uh, okay. I, 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 uh, I spend a lot of my life doing on, on the public health side. Great. Um, certainly have some experience with pandemics. Can you, did you ever imagine we would be in a situation like this in all your years of training and working on public health that, that the entire public health community would simultaneously become psychotic? And, and that's truly what it's been. This is an unprecedented response um, that defies logic. We talk or we keep hearing about follow the science, follow the science. Um, and this is really the most unscientific response to uh, an infectious disease that I've ever seen. Everything from the idea that we are quarantining healthy people, uh, which is not a concept that's ever been um, vetted in public health. Uh, we quarantine sick people, and that's something we've done since biblical times. You know, you take lepers and you separate them from the rest. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a tried and true method for st staunching the spread of an infectious disease. But the idea of quarantining sick people, uh, that, that's another, that's called tyranny. <laughs> uh, right. Not, uh, not public health. Uh, the idea that we are asking or mandating that healthy people wear masks to stop the spread of a respiratory virus, when in fact we know that masks are not designed to do that, they don't do that, and if anything, they probably increase somewhat the spread of certain uh, viruses because people tend to touch their noses and mouths and faces incessantly when they're wearing them. The idea that we are shutting down schools when children have essentially a 0% chance of becoming significantly ill uh, from COVID-19, let alone dying from it. The idea that we are testing people who are asymptomatic uh, for an illness for which they have, you know, 
people have no symptoms yet we are recommending that you know they get tested hand over fist all of these things are absolutely unprecedented they are not based in science um, and it has led us down a very very bad path in public health because amongst other things drew we have failed, we being the, the people in charge, have failed to look at the ramifications of right. these different mitigations on the entire population. And it's been devastating to tens of millions of Americans, uh, far more than would ever have been in fact in, impacted by the virus itself. Right. So that's that's the part that I have grave concerns about. And when you start seeing the substance use, the mental health consequences, the delay in medical treatments, it, it's getting distressing. Is there any conversation amongst public health officials, do you think, about sort of at least now that we're past the election or we're nearly past it, adjusting course in some way? Well, no. And unfortunately, although you know I've tried to stay largely apolitical during these discussions for all of these months, um, I would be remiss if I didn't comment that clearly the outcome of this election is going to have an impact on where we go um, over the next 24 months. It's very clear to me that that if Joe Biden is in fact um, in the White House, that we better batten down the hatches because we're looking at at least another 24 months of rolling lockdowns and significant impact on the economy. And that's very different from the way that uh, Donald Trump would have taken this moving forward. Uh, there's no question that Trump uh, had intended to really push for schools to reopen, for example, for businesses to reopen, for churches to go back to in-person worship and those sorts of things. Um, I think there's no question that Anthony Fauci and likely um, Burks and Redfield and Gottlieb will stay at the helm under a Biden administration. So we are looking at continued lockdowns. Schools will not likely reopen. Uh, and industries like the cruise industry, airline industry, gaming industry, those will continue to have significant uh, lockdowns and mandates and limitations on how they can function. And, and so uh, people are noticing that you and I disagree on the, on the mask thing, which is we've always talked about that. And, but, but your position on masks, I don't think they're really hearing it, is that it's a fool's errand. Isn't that sort of what your position is? My, my thing is I want to wear a mask because I don't want to infect anybody. I don't want to be that person that does that. So I feel like controlling my droplets, okay. If I happen to be walking around asymptomatic, that will, I'm happy to do that. But I think your position is this thing's going to do what it's going to do, <laughs> almost no matter what we do. Correct. And to be clear, I mean, there are sort of two groups of masks. There are surgical masks that you see people wearing and surgical masks were not designed to do that. Surgical masks, the reason I wear a surgical mask is to keep me from inadvertently coughing or spitting into an open wound and to keep me from being sprayed or splashed in the face by blood or other bodily fluids. That's it. I don't wear a mask in the operating room to keep me from spreading my cold to the patient or to the nurse I'm standing next to. That's not why I'm wearing one. Then there are masks like bandanas and all these cloth masks and all kind of things that we're seeing people wearing around. And those, if anything, and there was a nice study done by Duke University that showed that those, if anything, increase the spread. Because when you cough through that, that cloth, that bandana, it takes a large droplet and it disperses it into millions of little tiny droplets that then spread and get out. Well, so that's the uh, the aerosol. And the correct. aerosols have become, we, we, we have a follower here, Leopold, who alerted me to some of that literature weeks yeah. ago that the environmental engineers have been very concerned about aerosol spread. And now you're starting to see that in the common conversation too now. Exactly. So, so it's really a matter of, you know, there, it, it doesn't make sense to do it. And I think there's significant downsides of wearing the mask. It's not just a wash where you say, oh, it's an inconvenience. So what's the big deal? Uh, you know, it might work. So I'll wear one. There's a lot of downside. Number one, we're seeing a big increase in people having symptoms because they are rebreathing things they were intended to exhale, uh, dust, pollen, environmental uh, allergens, particulate matter, those sorts of things. I'm seeing lots of patients with perioral uh, outbreaks of everything from uh, herpes simplex, cold sores, those sorts of things, and vitigo, uh, which is generally caused by strep. We're seeing a lot of that. And then there's a whole very rich psychosocial impact 
um, of people wearing masks. The idea that we are creating a sea of faceless people and uh, everyone, particularly young children, I've talked with you about this through uh, kids between the ages of three months and three years who are just learning how to interpret nonverbal cues, yeah. uh, the ability to understand what it means when someone smiles at you or smirks at you or frowns at you. And they, these kids aren't seeing that. You see them watch them in the Walmart. They're looking at a sea of faceless adults. And that, that is a concern. That is a real concern. And we, we will see, again, that so much of this is an experimentation on a whole generation. And that's very, uh, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of school and cognitive development and social development, that kind of stuff as well. But let, let me, let's just do a, before we bring my, my guests in, I, let's just do a little bit on where are we with this pandemic? What do you think is going on right now? I, I'm pulling up a COVID tracking project. I'm going to look at the overall graph for the United States. And I've, and I've been mulling around in all kinds of different states looking at what the patterns are. What, what is your take about what's happening right now? Well, I continue to say that we are in a full-blown case demic, mm -hmm. meaning because so many of our guidelines have been based on the number of cases, whether or not you can open a bar or a restaurant or whether or not you can go back to school, it's all being predicated on how many cases. But the cases mean nothing, Drew, when you are testing people who are asymptomatic. Well, let, let's even let's even say they let's say it does mean something just for the sake of argument. Let's say let's say okay. all the cases we're documenting are meaningful infections. Even so, things aren't looking that bad to me. When when I look at the with the hospitalizations and the and the death rate, we're looking pretty good compared to. I mean, we have literally three times the number of cases, almost four times the number of cases, and. 30% below the hospital level we had when we had 30,000 cases. Right. Hospitalizations and deaths have continued to fall week over week, month over month. Uh, again, I'm not saying that COVID-19 is a hoax. It's a very real virus. There certainly are a subset of people who can become significantly ill from it. Mm -hmm. The great news is we've got an entire cadre of therapeutics now. We know how to treat people if we can treat them early. Mm -hmm. We know how to stem the cytokine storm and the overreaction of the immune system in those people who are more at risk for developing that problem. But the idea is that 80, 85% of all people who get COVID-19 will have few, if any, symptoms whatsoever. So following, but even if I give to you, okay, let's say all of those cases are meaningful uh, infections, then you are darn right hospitalizations are down, ICU admissions are down, deaths are down. Uh, Which overall. is good news. Good news. And it means either maybe younger people are getting it or we're doing a better job of treating it or both. And right. and we should be people should be encouraged by that rather than frightened by the fact that the cases are up. But the cases are up and whether or not they are real cases or just RNA detection, we don't know. Right. Um, but there does seem to be some spread, particularly in states that have not had previous outbreaks. Would you agree with that? Yes, and I think it, it does correspond somewhat to an increase in testing, uh, no question. And so you're going to have, anytime you increase testing, you're going to have increase in cases. Um, there's no question that most of the cases we're seeing are in younger people. Um, those are the folks who are getting tested, however, because they've gone to school. They've gone back to college. They've gone out, you know, to some kind of a rally and therefore get encouraged to get tested. So it's really we're kind of in a catch 22 uh, with the case numbers. But overall, there's no question that we are seeing positive results. Now, the other thing that's happening, Drew, and you have to remember is we are head on into regular old cold and flu season now. And the CDC uh, has already announced that they are not going to report on influenza numbers this year. Uh, so, which is, which is craziness because all that means is that everything will get recorded as a COVID-19 case, um, when in fact, many, many of them are probably good old fashioned influenza and many of them are the entire host of other, uh, respiratory viruses. Um, let's remember that, you know, 20, 25% of all common colds are caused by coronaviruses. These are out there. They're ubiquitous. Um, people come down with them all the time. So many people who test positive for COVID um, are actually having symptoms that were, are being caused by another virus. Let, um, let's, let's talk a little therapeutics for a second. I'm just, I'm just sort of, um, sort of um, 
polling, you know, physician colleagues and friends and stuff. So I'm going to bug you a little bit about this too. Did you see that new data on diperidamol persantine being useful I, for? I, yes. I, I think I'm going to, I'm, I would be using that now. I'd say if, if I have a moderate case, would you agree? Yeah, well, you know, I'm still uh, pretty plucky on hydroxychloroquine. Um, because well, it, well, that was going to uh, be my next question. What, what, what about hydroxy? Now, now, um, Invermectin has come on strong as an alternative to hydroxychloroquine. What, what do you say to that? Ivermectin is a great drug. Uh, it's been around. It's, it's really as well tolerated as hydroxychloroquine. Mm -hmm. It's equally cheap. Um, we've used it, and I'm sure that uh, your next guest can probably talk about it. Oh, for sure. <laughs> the vets know this drug well. I, I yeah. give it to my horses twice a year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's a common dewormer for uh, people who, who haven't heard of that before. We use it as an antiparasitic drug. Yeah used in animals well your your husband animals. your husband and i used to hand that stuff out at the county hospital back in the day we did quite a bit uh because a lot of ascaris and a lot of uh strongyloidy it was all kinds of crazy stuff we would see chinese liver flukes oh, God, uh, oh sounds yeah lovely oh yeah um nobody but, wants a chinese liver fluke but <laughs> But do you have a, a what what I, I'm persuaded ivermectin is the way to go. What what dose do you have any idea or the dosing patterns? That's kind of up in the air still. Yes, and I have to look it up because I'm not looking at. I don't want to give right. a long dosing, but it's a. Uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking it's 12 milligrams. Let me look. Yeah, up. it's around 12 milligrams for a 70 yeah, kilogram individual. But it, but is it a yeah. single dose? You do it for four days. Do you have a feeling about that? Most people most people are using it for multiple days in a row. They're doing right. it. For three to five days. That's exactly right. Okay, so you're in that. Good. Okay. That's, that's the camp that I've been in. Um, I, I'm I'm persuaded there too. And then finally, um, dexamethasone. Do you have a sense of when you're using that? Well, I'll tell you. I love ster steroids. I'm telling you, are the magic bullet. For, yeah, um, I think you're right. Controlling the cytokine storm. There's no question. Um, steroids have long been used. Again, very very well tolerated. They mm -hmm. can be given I am or IV. Um, they're dirt cheap, but uh, so people understand the role of steroids really is in stopping the overreaction, if you will, of the immune system that causes things to go south pretty quickly, causes people to develop everything from the blood clots um, to the fluid in their lungs. So I would tend to use dexamethasone earlier than not because there, I don't see any downside to it. Um, you're not talking about keeping people on high dose steroids for a prolonged period of time. Right. For many people, it's a single dose. That's what um, President Trump got was a single IV dose, um, and it really can turn things around. They're saying up to seven days if you're in, I guess, a bad situation. But uh, but I agree. I think a couple of days of it was probably a, an important thing to do. And I think I told you the story about when I had a severe Epstein Barr infection as a kid. Yeah, I wasn't getting better, and some enlightened internist told my, my father, who was a family practitioner, give me two doses of dexamethasone, and the thing just went away. Yeah. It's crazy. Steroids, it's, steroids like that are just miraculous yeah. for an awful lot of people. So, all right, I think we've we've reviewed the territory I was hoping to review. Susan, any questions about COVID before we switch to our new topic, veterinary medicine? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this up while you're talking to your fans. Well, the, before, well, you know, what, as you switch the segue to that, I will tell you one of the interesting things that we've seen during COVID uh, is an increase of like 6,000% in our use of human telemedicine. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, because there's been such a, um, a pressure on people and fear of people actually going to the doctor, going to the hospital and trying to avoid being exposed, we've seen a tremendous uptick in the um, utilization of telemedicine and human medicine. Um, it's And uh, I was already very keen on it for certain things. I think it has significant limitations. I certainly wouldn't uh, want you to be using a telemedicine visit uh, if you were having severe abdominal pain or chest pain or lots of other things. Um, and I, But let's face it, an awful lot of the reason people come in for visits is really for some coaching, for some reassurance, um, for some review on how to manage some simple things. And you can do so much via a telemedicine visit. Certainly great for follow-ups to do a check-in with somebody and make sure that uh, that things are on the right track. 
I can do an awful lot of reviews of people. And I spend a lot of my time because I'm in a rural area doing uh, some version of telemedicine with patients where I'm saying, well, take a picture of it and send it to me or, or, you know, show me what the wound looks like. And I'll tell you if you need to go waste your time going to the ER to get stitches. That's right. Uh, Lots of things of that sort. So maybe that's a good segue to your next guest. Well, here they are. (laughs) Thank you. Dr. Jeff Werber and Brandon, his son, Brandon Werber, who developed this app for tele-veterinary medicine. Uh, I'm going to interview Dr. Werber first here. Dr. Werber, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. So uh, let's first talk about ivermectin. Are we, are we, you have any concerns giving that to humans? Does uh, any of your experiences with animal give you any? I, well, I guess what I'm asking is because we use it so rarely in humans and it's so commonly used in vets, anything we should be watching out for when we use it in humans based on your experience? Yeah. yeah. We Good. find it to be very safe as well. Um, and there, there are many different forms of it. You have the ivermectin, selimectin. Uh, it's great for, as uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned, uh, for the parasites. And uh, we use it for mange. It's, it's very uh, successfully treats uh, uh, sarcoptic mange. Scabies, Interesting. Interesting. And a lot of the intestinal parasites. And it's used now in these certain medications that are multi-parasiticides. Uh, ivermectin will probably be one of the uh, ingredients, along with benbendazole, praziquantel, etc. cetera. So uh, uh, we love that medication. It's so funny. The the praziquantel and the babendazole, it's all stuff I used back at the <laughs> county, Kelly. I get your, your Ron will be familiar with that. I've I've not had to use it since, but we used to use it a lot back in the day. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Werber, what's been happening on the veterinary front that uh, motivated you to work with your son to set up an app? Well, uh, I have been a, a concierge doctor uh, for my entire career, and uh, I realized how much benefit clients and patients receive from having access to a vet, to a vet 24 seven. And I'm the idiot that uh, gave, uh, well, I've been practicing for 37 years. Mm-hmm. I actually gave them my pager number. Mm-hmm. I even still have a pager, which I get a lot of jokes about. <laughs> um, but you know, mostly they have my cell phone number and Brandon knows very well, you know, I would be getting up from a, a nice dinner table think I could take a call. And, but the, the benefits were huge. And I realized that I am a dinosaur. And most of my colleagues, especially the younger ones, who have this thing called work-life balance, um, I, don't, I couldn't find it in my dictionary, by the way. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so they were like, they think I'm nuts. So they, they didn't understand the benefit. And Brandon would hear it with the woes. And we had this idea that we should be able to provide this concierge care 24-7, anytime to anyone. And I knew what it should entail. I knew what worked but I have no idea about tech. Brandon, on the other hand, knows all about the tech, and he took this idea and built just the, the best platform on the planet when it comes to virtual care, telemedicine, and flexibility, where other vets from other parts of the country can take a call from one of my clients, and I'd be thrilled the same. And so tell us, Brandon, about that development. Yeah, I... Uh... So I had a bit of a different upbringing uh, and, and adulthood as a pet owner than, than most. Uh, I was very used to being able to take my phone out and, and text my dad. If I had, I've got two French bulldogs, I had an English bulldog, I've always had a lot of pets. Any little thing, if my dog sneezed the wrong way, right? Most people, what they'll do is they'll go to Google, social media, the, the French bulldog enthusiast group on Facebook, and they'll ask questions there because they know they're not going to get answers that are that are in, in timely in any capacity, uh, often by calling the doctor and certainly won't get good information going online, but they want it fast. Information needs to be instant. So I never had that, right? I would just call my dad, FaceTime my dad, text my dad, and in two minutes I had a response or I was on a FaceTime call with him. And it, it wasn't really until uh, he was out of town uh, and my dog had eaten something in the backyard called asparagus fern, and he threw it up and I see the fern, I take a picture, I do the Google image search and it says that's an asparagus fern. And then I Google is asparagus fern toxic for dogs. It says yes, but I couldn't reach my dad. And it was in that moment I became like every other pet owner and I had that fear. So when my father was putting all of this stuff together and and putting this wonderful team together of people in the space, um, I, I, I kind of worked with them and, and really understood that this was this was this has to be modern. It has to be simple. It has to be elegant. The touch of a button 
two in the morning and you're on a, on a live video call with a U.S. based veterinarian in seconds. Pretty cool. And that's Pretty what cool. it was all about. Yeah. And, and I'll get into more details on how, how to get it and how it works, stuff like that. But first, I want to give Kelly a chance to ask her veterinary questions since she's got that situation <laughs> right here, right now. Kelly's got two labs, uh, McGee and Hogan, and you've got the horses, <laughs> Donnelly and Molly, and you've got, is it a cat, Tiggy? Or what is I, I got, yeah, I've got oh, God, you remember? <laughs> yeah, two, two cats. All of, my, uh, all of my children have four legs. <laughs> uh, that, uh, I've got a lot of four leggers, horses, dogs, and cats. Uh, but I can certainly see why this would be so helpful. I mean, obviously, as a physician, um, I tend to do a, a lot on my own just because I can. Um, and uh, I've certainly been known to sew my own animals up and I, I give my own uh, injections and things of that sort. But even still, by the time, and I always say to my vets, by the time I'm calling you, it's because I don't know. I don't know the answers anymore. I'm now right. way out of my comfort zone. So the idea that you'd be able to call somebody and get somebody real time, because a lot of times you just have a question. And a lot of times you can talk them through it or show them a picture of it or say, just tell me, do I need to get up? I live in a very rural area. So for me to get physically to the vet is not so easy. Uh, and Sometimes it would be great if you could just say, let me run this by you. If I need to get them up and pack them up into the truck and, and drive into town, I can. But it sure would be nice to have an answer and say, no, that can wait until morning or, you know, here's the simple thing to do. So I think it's a fabulous service. You know, it's interesting is that what we found, and I've known this as being concierge in my career, uh, roughly 80 percent of emergencies aren't. Right. And right. when my client had someone to talk to, to help them through, ask the right questions, get mm -hmm. the right answers and put their minds at ease. And unfortunately, what, what we what we know is that most general practice veterinarians have hours. And then when they're closed, they have a, re a recording that says, hi, thank you for calling XYZ Animal Hospital. If you have an emergency, please go to so and so animal emergency clinic. Well, that client who's mm -hmm. nervous and anxious, trust me, they're in the car in two seconds and they're yeah. on their way. Then they have to wait. And of course, the fees at emergency clinics are higher and all that for what we would call the non-emergency. So we provide them the, the, those solutions, that virtual care. Uh, we, 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 uh, it, it, it calms them down. And they well, that, that, is, that is the key day. thing is distinguishing an emergency from a non-emergency, right? right? That's one right. key service. Exactly. The, the other thing I got to tell you, uh, Dr. Werber, that I've had frustration with, with vets over the past and I, I will point to my pediatric colleagues for I have the same exact complaint when my kids were little it, which was I couldn't I can't get people to stop and think to re because it, it th they're like hey eh, kid looks okay boom out of the pediatric office I'm like like no in in medicine in general medicine if somebody has a fever for five days it has a name I, I at least want the name of what we're dealing with ah kid looks fine out and and I get similar and I I, I'm, I when I go to vets often I feel it's that similar phenomenon a and and which would really always surprises me not great end of life management mm -hmm. uh, many times or they yeah. always need surgery <laughs> so, you're gonna have to have surgery so, i'm so, like he's doing backflips across the room i don't know what you're talking about so so uh, uh, so again let, let dr Werber answer that so you know interestingly because uh, you know, that comes down to diagnoses and you know i'm a gp and uh, i am accused often of being a good diagnostician and I think this because you, first of all, as Susan just said, sometimes just looking at the patient. I have a dog comes in. In fact, you know, we know Frenchies very well. And the, the, the conversation revolved around this French dog that was vomiting. And they had gone to another vet who wanted to run all sorts of tests. And they were on a second opinion. They come to me. and I couldn't even hold the dog and watch him in one spot for two seconds. He's typical Frenchie, jumping up and down, running, giving me major tongue. So the first thing I said to myself, this dog is not sick. So let's, let's find out a little bit about the vomiting. Well, it's not vomiting food. It was vomiting phlegm. Mm. And it was usually late night, early morning. And we call that the doggy version of gastric reflux. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This dog is yeah. not sick. You yeah. have to change the feeding habits. You can give it some, you know, some Prilosec or, or some Pomodavine and, and, and feed it, give it a, you know, and just watch it. And uh, well, maybe, so it, 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 it what I'm hearing you say is you, you'd you have the same criticism when I, I, we, we oh. look at our colleagues and go, they, they need to think, just think things through and look at things. Spend, just take a second. Rex has needed and, surgery twice. I know. And he's fine. You know, it's interesting. 
Uh, one of my slides when I speak is one we have to do is to, to better, better areas that can reason, think, and analyze. And if we get more of that, sitting back and looking at the picture, you know, that, that, the, the show that uh, was, um, you know, I, I see a lot of medical shows where this takes place, Dr. House, for example, looking, breaking down all the symptoms, mm -hmm. doing it right, doing it slowly. And that's what we as veterinarians have to learn as well to become really good diagnosticians. Then we realize that much of what we do wasn't necessary. Except in, in the in the house show, routine problems were were meant to be somehow a monumental finding. <laughs> How did he figure that one out? But yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, tell us, uh, Kelly, do you have any questions? I'm going to let you go in a couple minutes. Do you have any questions for your animals? Uh, no, no, actually. But I think that I appreciate what you're saying. I will tell you, I think the greatest skill in medicine, um, and I'm a trauma specialist, so I it's perhaps it's easier for me, is to, is to know sick from not sick. That is the number one thing. And if you could, and because parents of young children or pet owners simply don't have that, they don't have any way to know, is this really sick? Is this, right. the, is this the big bad one? Right. But if you can just help them to sort out in your telemedicine visit, is this patient really sick? Mm -hmm. Is this about to go someplace bad? And, and you know, Drew, that that's the key to all of medicine is understanding. There are lots of things that are irritating symptoms you can treat, uh, things that are uh, that are uncomfortable. But understanding the difference between those who are really ill and those who and, aren't, is and, key. you can give them that reassurance. And, and unless you're a medical practitioner or a veterinarian, people do not appreciate what we're even talking about, unfortunately. Right. Right. And uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, all right, Kelly, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for spending a little time with us. Um, we will Great. no Hi, doubt. Sweet. See if you can get Rex to come up there and say hello. To Kelly? No, yeah, I will. before she goes. Oh, to Kelly yeah, before she goes? I was yeah, see if... where my purse is in, but they're kind of. All right, right, come here. Rex, come here. Hey, buddy, come <laughs> here. Come here. Come here. Look at this. Look what I got. He'll he'll come up here, I'm sure. But come here. You know, he knows I'm trying to trick him. He's smarter <laughs> than I am. Here, you come up here. Here you go. Let's go. Here. So, this, Kelly, why are we waiting for Rex to perform? You. Um, after the show, come on, Rex, <laughs> and we'll have you. Uh, uh, I'll become your primary vet there on telemedicine, and you can here. pick my brain anytime you want. Whatever oh, yeah. you can kind of see his head. Here, oh, let's, let's see. Up here. Get him. There, there, he is. Is. there you are. That's right. There oh, he beautiful is. There and is. cute. Do you guys see? Are you as you're a small animal vet? I, I'm yes. guessing. Okay, I'm a small animal vet, but I I did work with an equine surgeon uh, for uh, about a year okay. before I got to vet school. So. Okay. I know a little bit about horses, but you give me a dog. We have uh, four dogs and six cats at home. Good Brandon boy. has his two dogs. So uh, I, I know those very well. Terrific. All right. Well, it's very nice to meet you, and I love your service. That sounds great. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Kelly. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Talk soon. Um, in fact, I'm on your website for AirVet. AirVet is the name. Oh, Hold on a second. I got yeah, to I gotta change the screen a little bit here. One second. Kelly. Let me see if I can. Oh, okay. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye, Kelly. Bye. Talk, Brandon. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. Uh, the, the, Wonderful. The, uh, I will tell you, Susan, on the screen I'm looking at, I see the restream on top of my guests. I know. I'm, so. I was covering it up while I was working okay. on it. Okay. So let's talk about the AirVet. AirVet is the app. AirVet is the website. AirVet.com is what I'm looking at. And it, it's right. it's so – I'm wondering if you had the inf you were influenced by something I've been involved with for a long time, a, a, an app called Heal. Getheal.com, which is a it's just a house call and telemedicine for f humans. Have you seen their product? Hold on, I'm getting them back up here. Hold on. Okay, hold yeah, on. I'm actually I'm I'm uh, very familiar with Heal. I think I think they uh, they they came up in this world doing telemedicine and house call. Yeah, um, pretty early. They were one of the early. Oh no, I was I've been working coming. with them for years, and and your yeah, your wonderful. website reminds me of the Heal website. It's and it's it all and I'm telling you, people will like that. They'll appreciate that that ease uh, and and uh, clarity on the website oh good yeah wonderful yeah so this is very much like that is it strictly telemedic tele televet or is there also potential for visits so right now it's all virtual mm -hmm. uh but it's 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 used in a variety of ways so like like you mentioned it's some of that triage you know half half the pet owners in this country don't even have a vet right so they're getting care on the internet and in social, right? It's just, it's giving them that access, whether it's two o'clock in the morning or at lunchtime, right? Somebody that they can trust to talk to on demand. So there's that, but uh, a lot of the hospitals, and we have thousands and thousands of veterinarians that use this, 
And a lot of it is in their day to day, right? So I'm sure you're familiar with like curbside, right? People, because of COVID, uh, hospitals have had to, veterinary right. hospitals have had to completely adjust the way they engage with clients and the client drops the dog off and, and they sit in the car and the, and the, the, the technician or the CSR, the receptionist will take the dog in. It, that relationship uh, is diminished because you can't be in the room and it's very, there's a lot of anxiety just sitting in the car right. waiting to see what's going to happen. Right. So you actually join the appointment from your car while you're sitting in the vet's parking lot and you feel like you're there and you get to engage. So there's nice. that element. And then uh, we may be announcing some things in the uh, not too distant future around uh, house house call uh, and bringing. Oh, nice. As well. Con- congratulations. It's a, it's a, and, and, uh, and so COVID, I'm guessing Dr. Werber has really been an opportunity for doing tele televeterinary medicine. Are there any legal issues the way, you know, they had to loosen up the law so we could do it medically across state borders. So we have some issues in the veterinary world and that is a VCPR, which is a veterinary client patient relationship in order for us to be able to actually make a solid diagnosis and treat, like call in the, the pharmacy to get a prescription. We have to have a VCPR, which can only be established by a hands-on exam. And then has to be maintained at least once a year by a hands-on exam, which has created a lot of difficulty because I took some calls about two weeks ago, interestingly, both from upstate New York Mm. and new patients. They did a great job. They adopted. We're we're seeing a lot of great adoptions during COVID. And yet they could not get in for a first exam as a new client till January. Well, that's unacceptable. Mm. You know, you have, I mean, come on, how do you have a dog who's brand new? You have to have a New York cat, has to be examined, has to be looked at, has some questions. So we've been working with those kind of people and doing as much as we possibly can to help them. But it, I'm sure from a lot of pet parents' perspective, it is very frustrating to not be able to see them there. So have they loosened these laws for you or is it still a fight? Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's really interesting what's happened. There are some caveats to this. And uh, COVID has loosened, even California, which is extraordinarily strict on these things, have loosened uh, uh, certainly during the during uh, the time of the pandemic and foreseeable future. Now, there's about 12 states that allow you uh, to establish the VCPR virtually, just like you can in human medicine. And there are loopholes in the VCPR. And we work very closely with you know the American Association of Veterinary State Boards, where um, in an actual emergency or something that can be perceived to be a potential emergency, you don't need a VCPR to treat and prescribe. So my my dad himself has saved many pets lives through that loophole where he was able to treat and diagnose and send prescriptions in what could have been a life threatening situation ended up saving those pets lives. And and tell me about the the network that this uh, reaches out to. How do you determine who's in the network? That sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, we have we have thousands and thousands and thousands of veterinarians all across the country. We're we're available in uh, all 50 states. Um, so every single pet owner on the planet, or uh, rather in the U.S. for now, getting ahead of myself, uh, in the U.S. can use AirVet 24-7 to talk to a vet. Whether you have a vet or don't have a vet, uh, whether your vet uses AirVet or not, if you do have one, you can use AirVet to connect with veterinary care 24-7, and the veterinarians will apply. And often the veterinarians apply to use AirVet in their hospital with their own clients, and then they get to swipe on or off, similar to an Uber driver can go online or offline to be part of this network. Let, let me give you a, a unsolicited advice, uh, and, and this is from my experience with Heal. The secret sauce on Heal is what you've got with your dad. A- and we have a, a nephrologist who's one of the founders, and she vets every physician that gets on the Heal setup. And, and that's always been the shortfall in some of these things, that the quality of the practitioner is not at a thing. I see who your dad is. I get how he practices. Make sure he vets everybody. That's all you got to do. Oh, yeah. And that, that becomes the secret sauce that, that, yeah. that other sorts of things like this don't do. Uh, I agree completely. And, and, and we're very proud of, of that. What, that's one of the things that we really prioritized on day one. We have a pretty grueling acceptance criteria Good. Um, in what we do and background and talking to our doctors. Um, and that's why in, in the app store, I think you'll find if checking out the reviews, those are all real unincentivized reviews, thousands of them talking about the experience with the doctors, because that's the first thing people will do when they want to know, should I trust this app or platform to connect me with the doctors? Can I trust the, the level of care that I'm going to get. If the answer is no, you could have the best tech in the world. It won't matter. You know, it's interesting. We have, if you look at those reviews, Drew, um, we have 3.7 thousand five-star reviews. 
And there's only one other company of the what, 15 uh, companies out there that has that breaks 100. They have 156. Right. So we know, and, and, and you said that's a great way to monitor. And we look at the reviews, we look at the comments. And Brandon has had the difficult decision of sort of letting that go, if you, if you know what I mean, because they didn't they didn't engage. You got to do that. You got that's know, the that's the secret sauce. I'm telling you, that's what makes a difference. Um, I, I have a couple of things. One is Susan. Shall we answer our question? There, there was a winner. Okay, I know. Ve- I was watching. I very early on. Let's not. I took the first one. I, I, I kept track of it. Are you sure you got the first I one? Did. I, I made sure I saw who the first one was. And I, there were two of them. Uh-oh. They were very close. Where to go? I, whoop. Oops. Sorry. Okay. I was going to my notes. Sorry. Uh, but let me have. So I'm going to have Dr. Werber answer the question. Shall I? Yes. All right. Okay. Dr. Let me put the question up again question is she, she's getting too fancy with all i know i know i'm what just, animals what might we need to worry about in regards to the spread of covid 19 dr werber okay so uh here, here's the, the the latest um dogs uh they can uh pick it up from us uh you you cough into your hands you don't pet the dog the dog one licks himself but dogs a cannot transmit it back to us and they don't instantly don't get sick cats will probably be as far as common animals now minks uh, unfortunately, uh, are very sensitive, and there has been a, a sad story of about 300 minks in a mink farm that died because of Corona. Mm-hmm. Um, ferrets also um, can get sick from it, but if you look at the stories about cats, and uh, even the the uh, the tigers from the Bronx Zoo, um, they they were they tested positive. They did show some mild signs of respiratory disease, but recovered. We find that the same in domesticated cats. They can actually. They can get the virus. They can be a little sick from it. They might be able to transmit it back. But most of the cases, interestingly, uh, these animals that have picked up the virus were coming from households that where, where COVID-19 was positive. One was a couple of medical doctors, husband and wife. Um, they both had it. They had a son and a daughter. The daughter got it. The son never got it. But their cats got sick. Hmm. Uh, but again, very mild cases. Um, so... My recommendation would be that if you or someone in the home is testing positive, and typically, as in our case, uh, the, the dogs and the cats sleep in our beds, it might be wise to separate them uh, at this point until we know more. So treat but, them treat them like any other family member. Well, I treat them like a fomite. It's almost like that that handle on the doorknob in the, in the freezer section at the market where they say, be careful, touch it, wipe it. Uh, just be careful because if they had uh, uh, contacted another dog that may have had it or an owner on a walk. It is possible, likely, not likely at all, but technically possible. And and there was some transmission in Denmark from the sensitive animals you referred to as the minks, right? Yes, yes. And so in terms of worrying about transmission back to the humans, it looks now like minks might be an actual reservoir. That's the only one. And so I keep my I keep my minks separated. So Uh Ashley was the first one to call out the minks, and then somebody said something about a tiger. Somebody said, "Should I kill my tiger?" No, no, no. We just (laughs) had the conversation. (laughs) Doctor Doctor Robert just reviewed the tiger. He just reviewed the tiger. No, just quarantine him. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) minks was where Ashley Ashley wins. Ashley got it on there quick. I don't know if Ashley's still here, but she was on Periscope. Uh, We'll try to find her. Oh, good. You saw it too. Yeah. Good job, Doctor Drew. I know you were because because there was uh, another one that came in like two seconds later and i was like oh oh." i know but maybe they'll be nice and but it was about it was actually (laughs) we'll we'll give out two okay that was okay that was a lack no 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 justin 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 main justin Justin main Main and ashley so if you're out there you guys on the thread i want i need you to email me at contact at dr drew ashley and justin main now they're now give me your information so i can forward it the um the thread is going crazy here asking about a new thread of COVID. I, I don't know that that's the story yet. Uh, all I know is that Minx got it, Minx transmitted it, and that's the story presently. So I, I would say that. Now, the other thing I wanted to do was show you our other animal and get a little diagnostic oh. test here. <laughs> because, uh, Susan, can you maybe put her up here? And, I'm trying to. Wait, let me get the. Uh, I have to open up the. So this is on. considered telemedicine, by this the way. This is telemedicine. That's right. Yeah, That's why I wanted to do it. Because I want to show. Good... People always do this stuff to me. She's like, you, if you didn't see, you didn't touch the person. Talk, okay. How can you know? 
If I showed you a rash, you you could you could kind of figure it out. You okay, hold on a second. Yeah. I got to do something first. And this is something similar to that. It's a body habitus issue. And then I, so this is an animal oh, that on. my mom adopted. She then passed away, and we took on to continue her care. I was hoping I'd get a bunch of money. And <laughs> I was hoping the will would say, if you take the dog, you get a half a million so, dollars. So uh, no such luck. Unfortunately, <laughs> she just came un. Uh, unencumbered with, unencumbered she came and with bad teeth yeah bad they wanted fifteen hundred dollars to do her teeth and, and she was other overweight stuff. and she had all oh, kinds she was, of stuff and her she was eating chicken dried chicken strips that's all she fed her because she salmon, was in salmon strips too right? i don't know yeah. it was pretty nasty well, anyway, can we let's get that she's over georgina, here she's sleeping here. georgina come here show her the cookie georgina come here here come here oh now rex is gonna get in the air <laughs> yeah, let, let's all right you can come over here rex georgina come on rex come here come here i'll give you something is she coming? I don't think so. I'll I get her. You're going to have to. I'll get Rex up here. Here we go. Let's come up here. Come on. Up. All right. Give it to him. All right. So this animal. Okay. This is a. Yeah. This is sort of a chihuahua something something. Russell. Russell. But Susan, maybe, maybe go. Can you move the camera? Well, I'm going to have to hold her up. You're not going to. Yeah. I'll, I'll fix it. So I'm going to show you this sort of. This belly problem she has, she <laughs> sort of, and she is well. She's well. She's carefully managed diet wise. She's well, muscular. Well, she wasn't when she got here. She runs. She's you know does everything sort of physically. Show them her teeth. Appropriate. Well, let's not worry about that. But <laughs> but our concern was could this apparently this breed gets Cushing's disease? Oh wait, nobody got to see her. Yeah. But do it again, Drew. Yeah, he's got it. He saw it. He uh, saw I, it. And, yeah, and wait, so how did Cushing's he, see it? he did. I, I held her up. Oh, um, I want people to see though. Oh, no, they saw her. Did Trust me, she was oh, not happy about it. Look. <laughs> uh, give her a cookie. Where is she? Here, I'll let me switch she, it. I'll bring her over. Just a, give her a little. Hold oh, on. Rex is going to take that. So, so we were, at, you know, people wanted to do all these dexamethasone suppression tests and one thing and another. And uh, what are you doing here? Everybody needs to see her. They they did just because you no, didn't. No, they didn't. They didn't see. Okay. Her. So Drew, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, first question. And this is what I would ask an owner, looking at that belly. Yeah. Looking at that belly, seeing the breed and the age, that yeah. would be high on my list of questions. Yeah. Does she drink a ton of water? Is she P-U-P-D? <laughs> does she pee what? P Is she P-U-P-D? Polyuria, polydipsia. Not drink really. Pee. No, I'd say no. Okay. I mean, I okay. she not any more than the other one, I'd say. Sorry. Uh, in fact, I, in I, fact, um, a little bit the other way. Like she, her urinary volume seems low a little bit. I would say, if I, if I were to say anything. Sorry, I so before to... before the dexamethasone suppression test or the ACTH response test, yeah. I would uh, look at a couple of other things. Number one, alkaline phosphatase on a basic blood panel, which on a, you said she's 12, 13, how old is she? We don't know. What do you okay. think, Susan, how old? She's about eight. Eight ten. Oh, eight, yeah, because she was like three when she got her, and then we saw a picture on Facebook that sure. was from five years ago, and I went, oh, that's when she first got her, and she was three or two or something. Mm. So we figure she's about the same age as Rex. But so her my, teeth... my first screener, yeah, my first screener would be AC, uh, the alkaline phosphatase level. Mm -hmm. and then what else? Uh, what are you, what are you looking for with alkphos? What are you looking for there? Elevation, elevation. I've had a high as 4,000. High for, almost 131. As a sign of, so, of the Cushing's. Steroid, exactly. Yeah. Steroid hepatopathy, so yeah. it's calling. Uh, then I would look at um, an ultrasound and see what the if there, what else in the abdomen could might be looking abnormal to give that bloated belly appearance. We we had a uh, just a basic plain film and it looked it looked normal. There was nothing going right. on there. And, and if uh, that is all normal, then I would say and she's not drinking, acting fine. I I wouldn't even recommend the the uh, low dose exit because I don't have enough clues that might indicate that this is Cushing. Great. So, uh, she has a big bump on I, her back. Because I, I just said, look, we'll manage the diet carefully and uh, just see how she does. And, and it's been fine ever since. And that Shout was like out three to Farmer's ago. Dog. Yeah. <laughs> that is exactly what I'd recommend. So uh, oh, yeah. I, I'm with you 100%. It's, oh, my God. It's funny. People think of telemedicine. They think about the, the medicine component of that. Dog is sick. Dog is injured. Uh, one of the biggest... Uh, uh, one of the biggest areas we get we get so many so much inbound so many consoles is, is actually around nutrition i'm sure uh, which is a huge part it's the fuel right obviously yep. it's human we get a ton of nutrition consults so yep. on your vet my well. vet was hopeless yeah. with that they get, they got all this prescription food they wouldn't eat it 
And then I got Georgina, so we were cooking chicken because she couldn't have, they couldn't have fat. And so we, and I had an el- older dog that passed right before yep. that. So we were just chopping up chicken and going through all this trouble. And then somehow, I guess one of the sponsors from one of the podcasts was promoting farmer's dogs. So we got a free mm-hmm. shipment and I swear to God, it's changed my life. I mean, they <laughs> yeah. eat it. Nutrition's every- a huge deal. Oh my God, it's amazing. So she's lost weight. She doesn't, she she doesn't always use the PP pads and pee in the house now. She goes outside because it's you know she's she's trainable. But when she does go inside, we didn't know this at first after she destroyed the carpet. But she will go on the pad. She's very smart. But like if we leave town for a week, she'll use the pads inside. She kind of you know rebels a little bit. But she's got that big weird sore on her back. I did, that's harder to see right which now. Which opened up and stuff, and they said, well, that's a sign of Cushing's, and then. They did, we didn't. No, get they her, never really said that. We didn't, didn't get the test because we didn't want to put her through it because she was still kind of new here, and we just fed her better, and she's been a hundred times better. But yeah, I don't know. Also, yeah. when we look at um, obesity, the number one nutritional disease affecting pets, and then this dog living with your mom uh, was obviously older, probably not getting the exercise. Um, uh, we see a lot of obesity in, in in dogs that are living with the elderly because they're not getting the exercise and they're being fed so much. And sometimes what happens is it's a vicious cycle. The bigger they get, the less they want to do. The less they do, the bigger they're going to get. Right. So we need to start cutting back on the food, forcing them to get out and do exercise. And that's probably why she's enjoying going outside more and taking yeah. care of business outside instead of inside. And um, that big belly may be nothing more than just overeating. Yeah. It, I mean, it's smaller now. It was dragging on the ground. It was she got bad. Here. She yeah. got here. And yeah, her teeth were bad. falling out. Her teeth are, don't smell as bad, but... She, her teeth are pretty much not so good in there. And very, I'm not very common. I mean, very common in the old if, dogs. if they're eating the farmer's dog, why do I have to get her teeth pulled? Like, I mean, they're going to fall out anyways, right? Well, the thing is, though, the, a lot of infection in the body, especially when it comes to endocarditis, the heart valves, and glomerulonephritis, the kidney filtration system, those bacteria literally started orally from the mouth. Uh oh. So, so, yeah. So it is important keep those teeth clean and, and do pull those teeth that are really bad uh, mm. because we don't want to introduce the oral flora into the bloodstream. Well, it's going to have to be post COVID cause I can't, yeah. I can't, I'm not going to traumatize her and not be available and stuff. Cause somebody was on the stream was saying, you know, they should let you go in with your dog cause they're yeah, being don't, traumatized. Don't, don't go past that. That, that long thing there that we have an update right there from Christopher on the, um, issue of a mutated virus apparently the danish government is taking this mutation very seriously they they feel like again i'm i'm not i need to more see more understanding what the mutation was about and what the problem is but this is the issue of the minks this is uh, they're going to kill a lot of the minks they're saying we have great responsibility towards our own population but with the mutation that has now been found we have an even greater responsibility to the rest of the world as well and she said in this news conference so she's going to kill a lot of a lot of minks. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Denmark has reported 52,000 cases so far. Um, and again, 733 The mutated deaths. virus has been found to weaken the body's ability to form antibodies. What does that mean? That, 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 I don't know. They, I need to see more information before I can really comment. Thank you, Christopher. That's, uh, but again, they're going to take the mink thing very seriously, apparently. All right, Rex, you're good. You're fine. You're it's, good to go. It's also fascinating, you know. And somebody well, did ask, can your cat pass the, the virus to you? If they have it, uh, it is it is possible. If any domesticated species um, would be the most likely, it would be a cat. Um, and and again, they themselves really don't get very sick if at all. So sometimes you don't know it. So that's why I'm saying if you have virus in a, uh, the virus in a household, don't rule out the potential for a cat to spread it to the other family members. Even though you are distancing yourself, you are quarantining yourself in your own bedroom. You're not, people are, are, are staying away from you, but the cat's going back and forth. Uh, that could be an issue. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's what I was Has thinking. it ever been documented or has it just been a concern? It's a concern, but no, yeah. they, it has been documented that they will test positive. Yes. And that means they have it in their saliva, yeah. in their mouths, which means they come and it, it would be Kiss you. <laughs> more likely. It would be more likely than dogs or, or some of the other animals. I don't know if many of our, our, your, your, your viewers, listeners that have pet tigers, so I would be less concerned about that, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but certainly uh, pet cats. Uh, I have six of them, so uh, I know. Oh uh, wow! It, 
It is possible. You know, it's funny because on my birthday, I had a party and somebody was really sick, really, really sick. And we all stayed away from her. But then later, her daughter brought the dog over and it was kissing her and kissing her and kissing her. And then, of course, we all had to pet the dog. <laughs> so three of us got sick. And oh we, were, we were avoiding her then. Remember that? Yep. And we, we blamed it on the dog because we were all hugging and kissing the dog. <laughs> we were hoping it was coronavirus. I know. It was like that, though. It was the worst. Put it behind us. Like, it was you know, very, had the same symptoms and, and we, <laughs> and we all got sick immediately. And I, I swear it's because the people who were avoiding them the most were kissing the dog. So my instincts, I don't know if I'm right, but it just well, gentlemen, good. congratulations on the project. And Dr. Werber, thank you for all the years of good service. Uh, I love it. I love yeah. this program. Yep. I knew, I knew Susan would be an enthusiast. I don't have a main vet. We go to a, like a, place that just does emergency care because my dogs always get sick on a weekend or a holiday every single time and um it's it's really hard because i can't just call them and talk to them and say hey you know something's wrong with rex it's not really bad I don't now think you can i know and and susan we also do uh, allow for people to come in i know many of my clients prefer it to offer as brandon was mentioning earlier uh, curbside where you can be live on the app. So there's interaction. It's as if the client is there, but they're still in their car. But people are allowed to come in, uh, obviously masks and distancing, et cetera. So uh, uh, don't let those teeth get too bad because I might be able to help you out. I won't. It's, they're better. They don't smell as bad. I, it, it's, it's just, um, you know. And as, as uh, if anybody has any reservations she's, about telemedicine. She seems okay. We, like. <laughs> we, we, we can see a lot Sorry. across a screen. We really can see a lot. And more importantly, as my father used to say, he was an old-time family practitioner. He was always at me. Your most important diagnostic instrument is your ear. Yes. Listen to people. Think about it. And so the ear is fully engaged with telemedicine. So and to air vet and telemedicine. Uh, I, just, I just would love Wonderful. to have a good vet, but I... You know, I like them, them for the reason that they're there for what they do. Uh, but and if it's a really bad emergency, they're great. But just for the regular stuff, it's sometimes it's a little meh. You have to go in. You, you can't make an appointment. You have to walk in and sit and wait and wonder. Hey, let me ask something. Uh, Rex has, has begun groaning a lot when he sits down. Is that just old dog arthritis -y stuff? He just does it every time he lies down. He big. Uh, uh, very likely. Uh, I don't know if he's ever been radiographed. The, the, we always look at a couple of things. Number one, obviously, is hips yeah. uh, and stifle issues. But also, uh, a common misdiagnosis or missed diagnosis is something called Carter Equina Syndrome. You guys know it as LS disease, lumbosacral instability, uh, L7S1. Dogs have seven uh, lumbar vertebrae. You guys have, we have five. Mm. And um, L7S1 is commonly missed. And that is often where we see a problem when these dogs are just slowing down, hesitant to go upstairs, hesitating to jump up on the couch, yeah. um, and just... Uh, He's and, doing uh, that, but he uh, runs like a maniac when oh, yeah. you let him outside at the same time. Yeah, but of course. He's also, kind of fat, too. Yeah. He's kind of fat. You got to take care of that. He d I've been trying. The, he just, I don't know how come. So, so that might be it. So well, he's, he's, also, he's doing exactly that. He's a little hesitant climbing stairs, and but he, he really hasn't surgery, been right? jumping up on things. That's no. what the doctors no. always want to no, do. No, they no, want to give no, me no. a big x-ray, and they go, we're going to have to operate. And then I go, okay. And he comes home, and he, he just no. does little somersaults everywhere. And I'm like, this doesn't <laughs> seem just, right. Yeah, send the extras to me. I'll be happy to take a look at them. Oh, thank you. There you go. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, again, AirVet. Uh, is there any other websites? Join.airvet.com slash Dr. Drew. Drew. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Brendan, well done thank on you. the development. Thank you for setting that up for thank me. You. I was just going to send it over to my guy, and you beat me to the punch. So you're a good tech person. I'm very proud of you. He is. He's very good. <laughs> Clearly. And then Clearly. we have a couple of people. Hopefully, we'll get the message to them somehow. I don't know if they're still here. Cause, um, oh, Casey. No, it's Ashley. Ashley, Ashley, and, and Justin. Yes. Yeah, we, we would be we would be more than happy to sponsor uh, some some uh, virtual consults. And uh, uniquely, the way our consults work, they're unlimited amount of time. There's not like a 15 minute consult window, and we actually leave the consults open for the same fee for three full days. So if a day later or two days later something changes or you have another question, uh, you can go back into the same doctor you spoke with and chat back and forth, and there's no extra fees to any of that. So we really care about that whole experience. There's a bunch of questions here about uh, CBD and uh, dogs. Oh, any, yeah, any I want to know about that, too. Okay, I figured. <laughs> so, 
So Sorry. Uh, we, 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 now you want to do another show? We'd love to do that. I Go know. ahead right now. What do you think? Is CBD. It, all right. So, yeah. So, again, in California, if it's industrial hemp, we can talk about it. Believe it or not, we are, by uh, California law, mm -hmm. uh, as a veterinarian, um, I'm not allowed to prescribe it or uh, wow. recommend it. It's crazy. Wow. But I can say something like, well, well, when I use that on my own dog, it worked really well. Right. So, I know that. Uh, so, right. uh, yeah, we can do that. Um, and, and so is I'm, any... a, I'm a fan. And uh, for the right purpose, uh, again, check guidelines. The problem is typically is the THC, we know very little about. We know what the LD50 is. I hate to use that word LD50, Drew. I know you know what it is. That's a lethal dose where 50% of the animals getting it will die. So mm. clearly, we need to stay away from the LD50. What we don't know is at what dose do we start seeing signs of toxicity based and, and to what degree. Uh, yeah. So until more work is done, Colorado State University is working on it. UC Davis, my alma mater, is working on it. Um, so now that it's quote unquote legal in California. So we still have guidelines, but overall CBD by itself um, is, I think, very safe. Um, you go start slow, talk to your veterinarian. If, it, if it's industrial hemp, hemp source, then they can talk about it and prescribe it. And uh, I have had a lot of success. Seizures, great. cancer, pain, energy, um, mm. I think it's great. Gentlemen, we thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll talk you. someday soon. That was really fun. Right, thank you, thank you so much. Well done. And thank Bye, you, Arlene. Guys. Thanks, Dr. Drew. Thanks, guys. Oh, you bet. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Arlene. And uh, for those of you on the stream, thank you for uh, staying with us. And, of course, to Ashley and uh, Justin, who are the winners, the recipients of the free visits. We'll have to figure that um, out. Anything else before I wrap this thing up with you guys on the stream right now? Uh, again, we are in this case demic, as uh, Dr. Kelly Victory points out. But it is, uh, it's, we're actually getting a little bit of an uptake here in California, too, right now. It's not anything concerning yet, but, uh, you know, only the virus knows. And again, um, although Dr. Victory was making issue of the low fatality rate, it's still a lot of people. Uh, it's bumped a little bit from 900 to 1,100 per day. Uh, let me see if I can get the California data up here, because California was sort of a holdout. It was doing very, very well. And then all of a sudden, it, well, I'm looking at Los Angeles and Orange County. Yeah, it's a little tick up. It's not bad. It's not bad. Hospitalizations, again, a tiny tick up. Death rate's still staying negative. It's going down on an almost everyday basis. So that's encouraging, at least for the moment. Uh, there are states that are having real outbreaks, so be careful. I think wearing the mask, keep your distance. I heard Dr. Paul Offit the other day saying that um, – that he would distance first, no, yeah, distance first, mass second, vaccine third, which was a sort of an impressive statement on my, as far as I was concerned. Uh, again, uh, I want to thank everyone for exposing me to Dr. John Campbell. I'm still listening to all his uh, videos. They're, they're quite clear, very well done. I like his thinking. I like his approach. Uh, Susan, that's that British guy you keep hearing me listening to yeah. that you call annoying, right? Yes. Yes. Annoying. No, not annoying. Oh, okay. No, you're annoying. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, and um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, anything else you got? Oh, they want to, Bobby wants Christina P and I to write a children's book. I don't know what. Oh my god, you guys are so funny. Yeah. She would be good though, maybe it could. It would have to book? be a comedy though. No, we have the rational recovery. That's our. That's our cause. Okay. We're going to return this country to rationality. I definitely want everybody to share if you care. This was a good show. I'm really happy that... Um, Christopher Lundgren, who sent us all that good information on the minks, also said we should get Dr. Campbell on the show. How okay. do we do that? If you guys have any contact for him, we'd happily... Yes, uh, bl blame? We'd have blame to do anything? it really early because, like, you know, it's hard for people to do a show from the UK at 2 in the morning. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. We could go earlier. We'd have to do a morning show. Yeah. Um, uh, back to the, the COVID data, uh, one of the things I find fascinating is we are at a much higher rate of cases than we were, say, when we were locked down and scared and shuddering in our houses and scared. So let's at least give ourselves a little bit of a nod for learning how to live with this thing, right? We're, we're getting, we're in spite of a large caseload, we are not hospitalizing that many people. Not many people are dying relative to the previous outbreaks, particularly at the rate of this outbreak. And we are going about our business. 
uh, and we were wearing masks and doing what we we're supposed to do. And I, I think that should be commended. Yes. Uh, and that we're not. Free. I, I feel like the some of the cloud of the of the mental health consequence of this is lifting a bit. I think some of that may be kids going back to school, universities coming back in. I don't know. Uh, so I would ask people to enjoy the the normalcy a little bit. We have to restore some normalcy. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know where this little outbreak, little outbreak, it's a big outbreak, is going to stop. I don't know what the you know final case burden is going to be, and I don't know if the hospitalization is going to go way up or the or the um, death toll might start to climb again. I we'll, doubt it. We'll I keep doubt talking it. about this tomorrow. Yeah, we'll get in here tomorrow. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. Uh, I'm not seeing Thank you any. so much for, for all your great questions. Yeah. Good job, everybody. Thank you on the restream. And, uh, do we have a time tomorrow, Susan? Two o'clock? Uh, anytime. So it's sometimes around this time tomorrow afternoon. We'll see you then. Real talk. Headlines have become, uh, it's sickening. They've become poisonous. Dissecting headlines. Defying state orders. Sheriff Bianco not enforcing what the governor is saying. Dialed in with decision makers. Clarify what you actually meant. Get the answers you need. At the beginning of this, we were told, don't wear a mask. Is this really helping? Expect a different kind of newscast. Fox 11 News Special Report. Weeknights at 7. The World Health Organization estimates that each year approximately 1 million people take their own life. That's one death every 40 seconds. Experts predicted numbers would peak in 2020, but no one could have imagined the devastation brought on by COVID-19. During the coronavirus pandemic, you may experience anxiety, sadness, and loneliness. Existing mental health conditions, including severe anxiety and major depression, may worsen. If you're feeling hopeless, contemplating self-harm, or you're concerned about someone else, I'm here to tell you there is hope. A Mission for Michael is dedicated to helping clients achieve complete inner and outer transformation. Mission for Michael is the premier resource for intensive mental health treatment in Southern California. With an astonishing two-to-one client-to-staff ratio, each client in their facility receives individual care 24 hours a day, overseen by a team of all doctorate or master's level clinicians. With a focus on evidence-based treatment, along with personalized and compassionate care, they offer mental health treatment that can change lives. If you're suffering from mental illness or you're concerned about a loved one, go to amfmtreatment.com. Again, that's a mission for Michael, AMFM, amfmtreatment.com, or call 866-581-4401. Again, that is 866-581-4401.